volume, geometric modulus on elliptic curve, is that something conference proceedings here or somewhere else? No, in that one, in that way, it's a <coughs> theta of the base of it. Oh, here. colder today. But then it gets warmer by the time the lecture gets <laughs> because of all the hot air right now. <laughs> For some of you, some of the material that I taught yesterday, especially the visual notation, linear notation, is new. Maybe at some point I can scribble a few exercises based on the lecture, but you can do it at your leisure. You don't have to hand it in. Okay. You can do it to get some practice with the notation and other things related to the lecture. I, I might just scribble them on a sheet of paper, and then you can just scan them, I think, yeah. Should we start now, or no? Uh, two more minutes, according to my watch. Um, it is late. Oh, is, this the, is it late? What do, what do you have? What time do you have on your cell phone? 10.30. 10.31. 31? Oh, OK, but it's after one. <laughs> Mine, mine is slow, so. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> now, yesterday uh, I spoke about um, the um, Chebyshev estimate on the prime counting function and uh, gave you the beautiful, elegant proof of Irish on, uh, on that result. And since many of the ingredients that were used yesterday can also be used to prove what's called Bertrand's postulate. I thought I would tell you a little bit how to do that. So Bertrand's postulate is the conjecture made by Bertrand, 1845, I believe. Bertrand conjectured that for all n greater than or equal to two, there exists a prime p such that n is less than p is less than two. So there's always a prime between n and two. He didn't know how to prove it. And he checked it for all n less than 3 million. 
in those days there were no computers, you could be checked it by hand. Wolfgang checked it. Seven years later, in 1862, Chebyshev proved this convention. <coughs> Essentially using the ingredients that were discussed yesterday. <coughs> and um, much of the development of number theory was in some sense motivated by this Bertrand postulate because it certainly started Chebyshev thinking about how to prove these things. And in the course of trying to prove this, of course, he, he uh, defined these functions. And so Chebyshev defined Unfortunately, I'm going to use theta because that's just Chebyshev's notation. This theta is going to show up again in, with a different meaning later on in this course. Pi of x. And this lambda n is a small nominal function log p, and n is a prime power, and zero otherwise. These are functions that emerged in the context of Chebyshev's work on Bertrand's postulate, and they seem to be more natural than the simple counting prime counting function. So pi of x is the number of primes, of course. And the prime number theorem, of course, is the statement prime number theorem is the statement that pi of x is asymptotic to x to the log x. And that this is equivalent to the statement that theta x is asymptotic to x. And it's also equivalent to the statement that psi x is asymptotic to x as x goes to infinity. All these are exercises. exercises in partial summation. Partial summation, which was discussed last time. So if you have never seen this before, I would urge you to kind of prove this uh, and get some practice in uh, using partial summation techniques. Now, in the context of yesterday's lecture, there were two theorems. One was Legendre's formula. That gave the unique factorization of n factorial as the product over prime plus minus to n to the EP of N, and EP of N is given by the sum uh, N over P to K, K going from 1 to infinity. And as I mentioned last time, this is not an infinite sum. This is a finite sum because as, it, as soon as P to K is bigger than N, the thing is zero, so it is really a finite sum. So you have this nice, fact, nice unique factorization, it's not exactly what you think, and using this thing we were able to show very, very good things. One, um, the other point was this very elegant argument that Erdős came up with, that if you look at all the primes up to x, products of primes, 
Holy Ghost is the S. The first one. Holy S minus one. These two facts were used yesterday. I think if everybody was here, was here yesterday, I don't want to expand on this. Okay. In the same 19, you know, the paper that uh, Erdish wrote when he was 19 years old, Erdish noticed that this formula of Legendre was really weak. This formula of Legendre was really weak. Why was it really weak? Well, he noticed that in the course of the argument, two n shoes n showed up. So he wanted to know, is this a factorization, unique factorization of unique factorial? <coughs> what is the unique factorization of two n shoes n? So Erdish observed. We look at two n choose n. This, of course, will have primes less than or equal to two n. And it'll be p to some power. Let's call it p kilo. But 2n choose n is nothing but two n factorial over n factorial n factorial, another n factorial squared on this n factorial. And because I have the unique factorization of n factorial, I have the unique factorization of two n factorial. And therefore, I know immediately from Legendre's formula implies that CP of N is nothing but uh, 2N over P of K minus 2N over P of K K by itself. From Legendre's formula. Now, the interesting thing about this, now this is where you know ordinary mortals just go on and just continue without looking. Um, whereas people like Erdős will say, will stare at this formula and <coughs> say something interesting. So observe. of 2x is less than 2x. This part is less than that. And then I, I'll take away more, or I'll take away less, rather. 2x minus 1, because the greatest integer of x is between x minus 1 and x. So we get this. And therefore, we immediately can see that, by the way, one more point. Oh, okay, let's just continue with this thing. We have two x's go away, this is two. However, um, the question of when is this, you know, when are these actually equal? Well, when x is an integer, uh, but this, this estimate certainly is really overkill. Okay, so it's less than two. The greatest integer of x uh, will not be x minus 1, it will be 
something large, <coughs> right? So this, this, this is a number of k. If x is an integer, we, there was zero, I mean, there would be zero here. But if, so I think you'll convince, you'll convince yourself that this is actually a strict inequality. So then whatever this, this polytic is, it's either zero or one. Just sum n stuff. Each sum n. Therefore, I should be able to factor things a little cleaner. So, 2n choose a can be factored into maybe various pieces. Let's let's say um, here first observe that um, the primes which are between n and two n only occur in the numerator. Okay. And they don't occur to any power higher than one. Because p is between n and 2n, and if it occurs to a higher power, it'll have to be p squared here, right? And there is no further multiple of p, right? So you can have this. And then you have the product p less than or equal to n, p to the p to the this. Fair enough? So far, so good? Second thing to observe is observe that if if um, p is between two thirds n and n, <coughs> then Pfn is equal to zero, actually. Just check it. <laughs> because 2n over p is strictly less than 3. So zero. 2n over p is strictly less than 3. But n over p is at least 1. n over p is between 2 and 3. So the greatest integer of 2n over p is 2. Okay. <coughs> n over p, n over p is at least 1. And n over p from the first one, n over p is less than three halves. Therefore, n over p is one. Two minus two is zero. This is the difference between addition and ordinary systems. <coughs> if you know this is experimentation, observation, the essence of scientific method. Hmm? You just don't, so I keep saying the secret of genius is to observe the extraordinary in the ordinary. Hmm? The disease of the modern age is the see only the ordinary in the extraordinary. <laughs> Couldn't care less. So this thing is zero. And therefore, this product really is 
nothing, there is no prime between Kuiper's and um, N. Isn't that interesting in its own way? These are of independent interest. Yeah. Okay. Since I don't need this anymore. I mean, so that no prime in that interval appears, so you don't need to worry about higher power. <laughs> There's not even a first power in the thing. <laughs> now, in this case, I'm going to break this up into two pieces. Smaller pieces. <coughs> let's let's look at this middle guy. I, you may wonder how did I get the square root here. You'll see. You'll see what I got. Okay. So what's going on here? Well, what is C P of N now? squared is bigger than 2n. So when k equals 2, there's nothing here. So Ernest was very happy that there was nothing there when k is between 2 thirds and an n. Obviously, he's trying to figure out, is there any other thing that there's nothing there? <laughs> in, the, in this lesser range, well, for two and onwards, there's nothing there. Okay, and we already remark that each sum n is at most one. Therefore, there was in that interval the CP of n is just one. This is getting easier and easier. cleaner and cleaner factorization of this little thing. Everybody see this? It is the power of P given yeah. some event. How was, how was CP equal to N? CP was zero already from K equals two onward because of this inequality. Yeah. yeah. And there's only one term, K equals one. But each term is at most one. So, it, oh yes, you're, you're right. We should put an inequality now. It's at most one. Whether or not it appears is a different. Yeah, it's at most one. So we have an inequality. Correct, that's right. Does everybody follow that? Hmm? Okay. Now, each sum n here is at most one. And how many sum n's are there? I told you already, this is going to be zero when 
2n is less than pdk. So the number of sum n is at most 12 k 2n over p to k has to be bigger than or equal to 1 in pdk to get something. And that means that 2n is bigger than or equal to p to k, and so k has to be less than or equal to log 2n over log p, greatest digit, right? This is big. So there are only this many sum ends, see? And therefore, on each sum end is at most one. There are that many sum ends. So I'm going to just get another inequality. I'm going to put C T of n is bounded by log 2n over log p. So far. Okay, that's okay. Now, p to the log 2n over log p is just a fancy way of writing. So each term here is just 2n. Two, two How many terms do I have? As many primes as I have up to square root 2n. Square root 2n. But I'm going to do how many primes are there? There are most root, n, root 2n primes. So therefore, I can put an inequality 2n to the power square root 2n here. Product root 2n plus root 2 plus root 2 times n p times product n plus root p plus root 2n p. Now we're getting somewhere here. So far, it's pretty good. It's all bare hands elementary numbers we're going to see. And now we can use that inequality, product of the primes less than x is at most four to the x times n. This whole thing four to the two-thirds n minus one. Well, minus one is going to be irrelevant, but I'm going to look for it again. Times the product in n plus two n p. So if you're after Bertrand's postulate that there's a prime, you want to show this guy is big. Okay? And you're getting there. So you've got an upper bound. You now need a lower bound for two n. Use Bertrand's postulate. Because if this was an empty product, by the way, an empty sum is zero, an empty product is a one. We just need to show that it's bigger than one. Then it's not an empty product. See? So we need to get a lower bound. So, so in order to show Bertrand's postulate, we need a lower bound.
combine with one you need this one. And the middle term is 2n cubed n. Originally there were n 2n plus 1 terms, but by combining I get 2n minus uh, 2n minus 1 term, uh, 2n plus 1 term, I only get 2n terms here now. So the large, as you all know, the largest binomial coefficient is the middle one, which is 2n cubed n. So all these binomial coefficients are less than 2n cubed n. And how many are there? Well, I, I rigged it now, but there are only 2n instead of 2n plus 1. Okay, because I took advantage of a sharp bound that 1 is strictly less than 2. Therefore, um, you get a lower bound on 2n cubed n. So what do we have here? We have, let's go back here. This is our lower bound for 2n cubed n. And this is our upper bound for 2 n cubed n. Therefore, we have an inequality for the n divided by 2 n is less than or equal to 2 n to the power root 2 n, 4 to the power 2 n, 2 thirds n, minus 1. Well, this minus 1 is irrelevant, but it is a product. n less than or equal to less than 2n plus log b is bigger than or equal to. Well, there's 4 to the power n here. Forget all these itsy bitsy minus 1s. There's a 4 to the power n here, and there's a 4 to the power 2 thirds n. So there's a 4. When I move to the other side, I get a 4 to the 1 third n. When I take log, I've got 1 third n. So plus O of root 2n log 2n. So you see now probably big O notation is just like this. Don't bother your head with all the other stuff. There's, there's a minus 1 there, there's a 2 here. Ooh, just <laughs> throw it out. <laughs> just when you take log, that's a log n. That's consumed by this one. We'll need to worry about that silly look to end there. So you get this. Now, this is of the order root n. This is of the order n. Therefore, this dominates. Not only is there a prime, there are tons of them. Okay. So this is there to just take quite a few proofs. Now, the beauty of Erdős this proof is that um, you can explain it to a high school student. Okay, it's not something I haven't used calculus of any kind. It's all high school math. It's bare hands. Nothing looks great. But there's a nicer proof which is a lot shorter and uses first year calculus, I would say, uh, due to the monitor. And since it doesn't take long, I can do it in five minutes, so I'll just show it to you. And you get a better result. Okay, this is due to the monitor. So there's a shorter proof. So uh, this, what was the point of combining those two one plus one in the text format? Pardon me? What was the point of like making the terms into two n instead of two n plus one? It Otherwise doesn't you will have two. Oh, oh I can get two n plus one. No, there's no, yeah. there's no, there's no. There's no problem. There's no. Yeah, uh, no, actually, I'll tell you, there's a small advantage in those kind of things because if you wanted to, you see, uh, there's, in this big O stuff, there's always an implied constant. And so you'd like to know when is this really bigger than this. Yeah. And I believe in the original proof of Erdős, he manages to get numbers, which makes mm -hmm. it a little bit cluttered. Mm -hmm. And 
then shows that this is valid for n bigger than 5,000 or something. And if you didn't put that extra thing, I think you get 10,000. That's all. Yeah. Otherwise, you're absolutely right. I could have done 2n plus 1 and done that, and it would have been old log n inverse that didn't matter. But it might be. So here, you could clean this up and get n bigger than 5,000. It's fine. So n less than 5,000, well, Bert can't check because that was 3 million, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, he can check for a little more. Take his word for it <laughs> and, and finish it up. Uh, so let me show you a little bit about uh, Ramanujan's proof. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you want to just finish it off, uh, this is the point. The point is in analytic number theory, first thing is to prove it for n sufficiently large, and then tinker about the constant. Most people tinker about the constant before they even have a theorem in the, in the first place. And I don't want to make that remark again about algebra, it doesn't really fit. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, so Bertrand's proof of uh, Ramanujan's proof of Bertrand's postulate is um, uh, follows from the following uh, observation. So, the fact that every number, since every number can be factored, every natural number, can be factored. Every natural number can be written as a product of prime powers. Take logs. Log n is equal to sum of log p of how many log p's? As many as the power. And the von Mongo <coughs> function keeps halves on that. Okay. Therefore, summation n less than n. Log n equals summation n less than n. when you see double sum, you interchange. Either you interchange or you stay where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Let me write it like this. DE equals N, and D, and you interchange. that the d times e equals n, and just combining it into this single sum. And now I rewrite this as summation e less than or equal to x, summation d less than or equal to x over e, psi of, uh, so, sorry, uh, lambda of e, lambda of e. So this I recognize as psi of x. E less than equal to x psi of x over e. Remember what psi was. Psi was the summatory function for the one mongo.
call the left-hand side T of x. And last time we discussed partial summation, and we discussed when you have a continuous function like this, you can just replace it by an integral. Integral of log t is x log x minus x. So we, we saw last time by partial summation, T of x equals x log x minus x plus o log x. So we saw this in yesterday's lecture. And so Ramanujan makes this clever com combination T of x minus 2 T of x over. What is that? Well, I know what t of x is, and I know what t of x over 2 is. So you just shove it in. So what? So x log x minus x plus o log x minus 2 x over 2 log x over 2 minus x over 2 plus o log x, but I'm not going to put it in here. In the other term. This O of log x covers it. Give you this. Don't shove another O of log x. There's no need to do that. This is the beauty of this notation. It uh, allows you to not clutter up your head and the page. Don't do it. I, you wouldn't believe it. I've seen papers in which they keep umpteen versions of O of log x. What's the point? Unless you're really after those constants, which is you shouldn't be doing that anyway in the first place. Uh, so this is, keep, it's good to keep that in mind. Now, now what we have here is, <coughs> well, x log x minus x minus 2 x over 2 log x minus x log 2 over 2 minus x over 2 plus o log x. And the nice thing is, all these 2's cancel. And so x log x becomes x log x, the main terms go. Well, there's, but there's a minus x here. And there's a plus x, oops, sorry, I made a mistake here. Um, no, no, sorry. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine, yeah. The, the minus x goes away with the plus x, that's fine. But notice that there's a minus minus x log two, so you still win. You have x log two plus all x, all of log x. Isn't that neat? still constant x. So t of x minus 2 t of x over 2 is x log 2 plus o log x. But t of x is the psi of x over e, summation psi of x over e. So what is that? P of x is equal to psi of x plus psi of x over 2 plus psi of x over 3 plus psi, plus psi. Of course, it's not an infinite sum because as, well, as soon as the n becomes bigger than x, it's 0 again. Hmm? Get that. And what is P of x over 2? Well, it's psi of x over 2 plus psi of x over 4. Right, t x, x over 2 is this. We're going to double that and subtract, right? That's what's going on. Subtract. Okay. 
of x times 2 p of x over 2. It comes in alternating series, psi of x minus psi of x over 2 plus psi of x over 2. talking about the, uh, <coughs> you know, the Turan series. So this is Ramanujan series. <laughs> so, what do we have here? We have an alternating series. So in other words, x log 2 plus O of log x equal to summation uh, minus 1 to the n minus 1 psi of x over x. Rewrite this for you. So when n equals 1, the sign is 1. When n equals 2, the sign is minus 1, and so on and so forth. So to compensate, we have an alternating series. Now the psi function is an increasing function. And so we could write this as psi of x minus psi of x over 2 <coughs> plus psi of x over 3 minus psi of x over 4. You can kind of couple this. And what we have is definitely, these are all positive. <coughs> Therefore, um, we certainly have certainly have uh, okay this, this what I said is fine but for the purpose of Bertrand's postulate you want to get a lower bound on psi of x over 2 right that's what you want to get psi of x minus psi of x over 2 therefore you would rewrite this as psi of x minus psi of x over 2 So on one hand, so we certainly have psi of x. Certainly less than or equal to um, it's less than or equal, so the uh, other, all these other terms are positive, so it's, it's less, certainly less than or equal to psi of x minus psi of x over 2 minus psi of x over 2. Every other term is minus, so it's got an upper bound. I'm just going to remove this. Notice that um, we just need um, an upper bound. So from from one. So let's from the first estimate. So by iteration, iterating the first inequality. So psi of x minus psi of x over 2 is less than this, psi of x over 2 minus psi of x over 4 is less than this, so on and so forth. It's 
small x of pi is going to be show that sine x is bounded by 2 uh, x log 2 plus O of log x. So I'll leave that as an exercise. Okay. So you can do that as an exercise. Maybe, maybe just to be on the safe side, because there's log x iterations, we can just do that. Do that. Hmm? But whatever it is, you have an upper bound. And therefore, for the second inequality, give psi of x minus psi of x over 2 is bigger than or equal to x log 2 minus psi of x over 3 <coughs> plus o log x. But psi of x over 3 is bounded by <coughs> 2 x over 3 log 2. Therefore, what does this show? This shows that there's a prime power between x and x over 2. But you want a prime. So <coughs> how many prime primes and prime powers? Every time you have a prime power, it's either a p squared or a p cubed or something like that. How many squares are there less than x? Square root of x. How many cubes are there less than x? Cube root of x. And if you think about it, you're not going to get more than Law x to the half, actually, if you think if you do it. So there's an O of x to the half. Therefore, theta of x minus theta of x over 2 is bigger than or equal to 1 third x log 2 plus O of theta. You don't carry that log squared x, because log squared x is much smaller than root x. So root x. And still we win, because this is a much shorter proof. Very nice thing to just do the Ramanujan. Now, in uh, Ramanujan's paper, this was his version of uh, you know, uh, Sutra Lipa, Sutra, of course. <coughs> Jevon Mehta, I think, is the one that I think wrote this paper with. Uh, so we noticed that, uh, I mean, Ramanujan uses Stirling's form. So you not notice that there's no Stirling formula at all. And you could have get, gotten that with P of X, which was done by partial summation. And even that you really don't need if you just do comparing areas and equation variables. Okay, so this is a nice cute proof of that. Okay. Now let me, uh, with the time remaining, begin my uh, crash course on probability theory. I'm hoping everybody's had some basic course, but I will review the terminology and notation to give nice easy standards. So basic probability theory. Probability theory uh, has actually three names in mathematics. Uh, the discrete probability theory is often called combinatorial. Okay, and probability theory, of course, well, but measure theory is a part of pure mathematics. So we have combinatoric.
and then you have measure B. And the funny thing is, um, the terminologies in some of these rules differ, especially the rules of measure theory and the rules of probability theory, different terminologies. And that could be a source of confusion for youngsters, okay? especially those beginning to learn both things at the same time. Um, so I'll try to explain what going on. Uh, in the discrete case, of course, it's very simple. If I want to know how many objects in this particular set have a certain property, all I have to do is count the number of elements in the set that have that property, and divide by the number of elements in the set to say that the probability that I'll pick that element is that. You see. So this is all very nice and easy. In the, in the measure theory context, you have usually um, a, a measure space and some sigma algebra and the unfortunate letter mu for measure. Okay. So here, omega is um, a fixed set. F often called the sigma algebra. What is the sigma algebra? It's a collection of subsets of omega, which is closed under complement Countable unions and countable intersections. So, sigma algebra is just the algebra that's generated by the processes of taking complements as countable unions and countable intersections. And then this mu is a function on the sigma algebra. And it satisfies some various laws. Mu of the empty set is zero. And mu is countably additive. That means it's mu of a disjoint union of Ki, which is the sum of the mu of the Ki. This uh, union with a dot is my notation for disjoint union. So there you go. So you, this is basically, these are the axioms for measure theory. In fact, it's interesting that these axioms were not rigorously formulated until 1933. Kolmogorov and his work. Measure theory axioms from Exactly what is a measure space and the independence. <coughs> so now, often one would like to say a probability space is a measure space such that the total measure of omega is one. If this happens, then we call omega. Now, in um, the context of measure theory, a real valued function is called a measurable function if um, the inverse of every open set is measurable, that is in the sigma algebra. Inverse of 
open is measurable. of the Enigma algebra are called measurable sets. Okay. It is a measurable set. And therefore, A is a measurable set. Open is measurable. Um, in the case of probability theory, also we have the same um, definition. But the um, measurable function of uh, Measurable functions in probability theory often are called random variables. That's one source of confusion for the beginning student. Um, measurable functions point of view, but from another point of view it's not. Actually what's, what's going on is there were two groups of people trying to understand the same thing. The pure math people and the probability people or the statistician or some you know, non-pure math people and trying to describe um, random events. Um, so they, in probability theory, uh, we will call omega a sample space. And elements of the sigma algebra are called events. So you see where the problem is? All these different terms for the same thing because of the perspective you took. Now, then you may say, well, why don't you just unify everything? It's almost like you have many languages on the planet but each language has its own charm and beauty. Um, so you should learn to converse in both. That's the, because each has its perspective. The random variable perspective has its psychological advantage. The measurable function doesn't. So what these guys were trying to do is extremely very simple. It starts with Damar in 1775 or where uh, you take a fair coin and you want to toss it, the problem is heads is one half. And so if you keep on tossing it, let's say a thousand times, you should expect at least 500 times heads. And the question was, can this be made mathematically precise? And uh, I suppose the first person who answered that was Dumas. Hmm? And we'll, we'll see uh, how that works. So, this, the, so they didn't think of a measurable function as we would think of it as, but rather they thought of it as a random variable in the sense that we don't know, is it going to be heads or tails? And each time you toss the thing, what is it? So if I conduct an experiment, I have heads, tails, heads, 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 tails, and so on and so forth. I can tran and let's say I have a hundred tosses, I can translate that into a, a, um, a hundred tuples where I would put either a tail or a head. In. So each of those things is a, is a value of this experiment. So that's, a, that's the psychology that they had when they were developing probability theory. And it was on very shaky grounds. Much of it was on shaky grounds. That's why the Colmo Moral business of trying to put everything on a very firm axiomatic foundation, like we would do in algebra or group theory or something like that. You put it on rigorous foundation, it, um, it helped, but then the terminology is stuck still. And it's probably not a good idea to go around changing it. Okay. So, so this, is, this is one important point. Uh, another important point is now that uh, we're looking at real numbers. So maybe, and this is as far as I can tell, 
um, work to do type of thing. There is considerable work to do in the development of problems where you will try to develop a theory where it's not necessarily real logic, but some sort of topological group. And that would be very helpful in, in number theory, especially, let's say, you know, p-adic roles or idyllic roles and so on and so forth. So there's things like that. I actually have a student working on parts of this uh, idea. But we'll f confine our attention to this real logic question. Okay. So now that we know what a ra random variable is, a random variable is essentially a measurable function on a probability space. What is a probability space? Measure space with total probability one. And for measure, I will not use mu, I will use p. And instead of using d mu, as you would do in the Lebesgue theory, I would use dp. Now given Given a, a random variable, given a random variable, yeah. now here's another interesting twist, standard notation. Normally in mathematics we use this f for a function measurable function f and so forth. Well, people use it x, capital X. They use different notations, hmm? capital X. I'll tell you why, it's gonna be important. <laughs> it's this nuance of language. Don't go around translating one from one language to the other, don't do that. Try to think in that other language because there's a psychological advantage. Okay, so given such a random variable f, if the random variable takes on a bunch of values, suppose that the, the range of x, suppose x takes either a finite set of values or a countable. such a case, we call x a discrete random variable. <coughs> it's like the coin tossing. I toss a coin so their head will carry it one way to the other. Those are discrete random variables. If values in some interval in say in say that uh, x is continuous In the discrete case, say x takes v1, v2, dot, 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 then the probability p that x takes vj, let's say this value, is called the distribution function. And in the case that it takes on <coughs> values in an open interval of something in the real line, in the continuous case, the probability that x, 
simplex is called is is called the the distribution function of x. And often and often denoted Yes. The, the word distribution is used in two senses. Yeah. But in the discrete case, it's understood as this. In the continuous case, it's understood as this. I'm going to just change this x to a little bit of x. It's the same as word. Yeah. No, no, there's quite a con confusion of terminology in this whole business. Yes. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was an undergraduate and I was learning probability theory, um, I was annoyed by this, these terminologies like random variables and, and one of these called predicting a measurable function. And, and, you know, I was a pure mathematician of, of, by training and I didn't like the probability theory people's terminologies. But later on I understood the psychology of uh, the factor, which is very important. I mean, it'll come up in the later lectures today, but not today, maybe today. Now, in certain cases, when something is called absolutely continuous functions, you can differentiate the density function, which is sometimes, in certain cases, if we, when we can write uh, f sub x of u, the integral from minus infinity to u of f sub x of t dp of t so I'm just going to put this dp of t as f sub t if I can write my density function as an integral of something like this this thing is called a density function and how should we think of a density function well the probability that my random variable takes on a t. Well, the probability that your random variable takes on t is probably zero, but it's the, the, uh, it's the infinitesimal step. It's the direct step. <coughs> Here it was pretty clear that random variable, it's only taking on discrete values anyway. So it, in this case, the distribution and density is more or less are the same. But here, they're not. This is a certain density and this is a di distribution. So this is a terminology, f sub x is called Um, we have a situation where um, you see this is this is to be thought of as the probability that the function the random variable x takes the value t clearly in all these cases in those cases it's got to take some value It's better add up to one. The same thing here. This minus in infinity to infinity, f sub x of t, dp, dp must be equal to one. That's the full value. That's the density it's got to take one. Because this is the distribution function, and we're now moving into infinity, and so it's the, the fact that it'll take on some value is one. That's all. So we have these two statements. Given any random variable. Now, you already know um, many distributions that you've met, but there's nothing special about them. So in other words, if I had a 
sequence of, so you give me a random variable, I get a sequence of numbers, these numbers, such that they add up to one. You give me a continuous random variable, I get this function, density function, that it integrates to one. Now the question is, can I go in the reverse direction? You give me a sequence of numbers, suppose, summation aj. with a countable range, such that, or finite range, whatever you like, such that this happens. Also, if integral minus infinity to infinity, f sub x of t dt dt is one, so we can construct. probability of x plus infinity u between that x sub x and between uh, that capital x sub x. Which is that distribution function. So there's nothing, so there's a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between discrete probability distribution functions <coughs> and sequences of numbers, aj, between zero and, of course, I did all these left numbers in one already, so that this happens. And you can, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So I can, if one can interpret the theory summation aj as representing some sort of probability distribution, same as Every time you see an integral evaluated into one, you can try to interpret the integral as a density function of some random variable. See now the psychology? So to see the extraordinary in the ordinary, you can go back to your first year calculus book and check each of those things and look at it through the lens of a density function. So I'll show it to you in a second. Um, the most familiar example coming from the coin tossing experiment is the Bernoulli distribution. Which the probability of x equals k is given by n to k p to the k, 1 minus p to the n minus k. Okay, in comedy, what's the probability that I have k successes, k heads in n tosses? So the sample space is all the possible outcomes in n tosses. So that's, you know, all the events are, so the probability that there will be exactly k heads is given by this. So this is what's often called the Bernoulli distribution. And because the summation and choose k, p to the k1 minus it adds up to 1. So another one that you're probably familiar with is the Poisson distribution. Here, this is e to the minus x, x to the k over k factorial. So you're going from 0 to infinity. This equals one, is it not? So according to my philosophy, anytime you have a sequence of non-negative numbers adding up to one, there's a probability distribution. So the probability that x equals k is simply e to the minus x, x to the k over k factorial. So these are both examples of discrete probability distributions. This is a finite range. 
and this is accountable. And usually, the Poisson distribution is derived as a limit case of a Bernoulli distribution. That's how it was named in the first place. But now we can look at it this way. The Poisson distribution will make its appearance later on. But for the time being, let me just highlight another important continuous distribution mainly the normal distribution. Well, that comes from the fact that the normal distribution Norm, the density function is 1 over root 2 pi, even I will just say this. Now, how do you see this? Let's, there's a one-line proof of this fact. It's worth refreshing people's memory on how this is proved. One-line proof using first-year calculus, not second year. First year. You might know the second year calculus. So that's, let's call this I. This is just, you want to show I is one. Okay, uh, okay let's, let's call J this integral, minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus x squared over two. Yeah. Want to evaluate that and show it's root two pi. So let's realize that it's two integral zero to infinity, e to the minus x squared. So j squared, co co common technique in this thing, is 4 times 0 to infinity, 0 to infinity, e to the minus x squared over 2 plus y squared 2 dx dy. So you just multiply square the integral and you get that. Now the trick is to put x equals ty. the inside integral of anything, right? Zero to infinity, <coughs> zero to infinity, e to the minus x squared, uh, sorry, t, t squared y squared, uh, t squared plus one y squared, over two, um, d, dx is the same as y dt, so it's y dt. Everything is absolutely convergent, therefore I can interchange. Interchange integrals. And then I look at the inside integral. Which everybody here can do. <laughs> okay. Method of substitution. Put, you've got, forget the t squared plus one, you've got a y squared there, differentiate y squared over two, you get the same thing here. So it's clear that it's four times integral, zero to infinity, r can, uh, sorry, I'm going to jump in the gun. It's uh, d, dt over one plus t squared. So it's integrated, it's e to the minus t squared plus one y squared over two over t squared plus one. And then evaluate it with limits zero and infinity and then just take that. You end up getting this. So okay, let's see that's the same as this. And that's just r can infinity. R can infinity minus r can zero. Well, r can infinity is pi by Two, so it's two pi. Okay. Therefore, it's very tricky. So this is not difficult to check. And don't notice I did not use polar coordinates. That's 
second mishap. So, therefore, there's a, a probability density function with this thing, and that's called the normal distribution. Normal density function. Okay. Now, um, I was going to finish this um, essentially what's called the weak law of large numbers. So before I state that, I'll give you a quick definition. So um, a sequence of random variables x1, x2, uh, and etc. is called <coughs> of measurable sets K1, KK, the probability that x1 x1 of mu I'm not going to put the mu in here x1 is the a1 x2 is the a2 xk is the ak this probability same as the probability that x1 is a1 times the probability that x2 is a2. In other words, the joint probability is just a product of the probability. And this is for any k. So any collection of pick, you know, k is going for arbitrary k, for all k. So you have a countable set, you just take, and if you have all this, it's called independence. In another way to think of independence is exactly the way the probability people were thinking about independence. My first coin toss has nothing to do with the second coin toss. Unless you're Shekhar <laughs> Has nothing to do with the, right? It's independent in each case. So. Uh, that's the way they thought of it, independent. So you have independent uh, random variables, and a sequence is called identically distributed if their distribution function is the same. density function, if they all have the same density, or the same distribution function. You see the way that how they interchange these words? In the sense of um, density function or distribution function, distribution function in the continuous case has a density function. In the discrete case, there is no density function per se, it's just a distribution function. So it's better to use if they all have the same distribution. definitions I need before I state the theorem. One is the expectation P of X of a random variable. And that's just the integral X dP. And in the in the discrete case it's also to be understood in that fashion. It's the expected value 
of the function. So you should think of it like this is x of u, dp of u. Uh, what is the expected value? And so you're, you're getting it with respect to this probability. This is the probability. dp of u would be the probability that it takes on u. So that's the expected value. Often denote it as mu or mu sub x. Unfortunate notation, <coughs> but it's the way we stick to it. Then there's the variance of x, which by definition is just simply, when, when it's convenient, I just drop the substitute x for mu. So the, so the expected value of x is, will always be mu, and so you want to measure how fast, how much does the random variable deviate from the mean value, and so it's natural to take this as the measurement, how much it varies. It's a very often denoted as sigma squared um, variance. And sigma is often called a standard deviation. Sigma is called a standard deviation. Now, small exercise. variance of x plus y is the variance of x plus the variance of y. It's a small exercise for you to do. And with that terminology in place, I can now say what is often called the weak law of large numbers. Identically distributed. Distributed random variable. Uh, in the literature, people denote this as I, I, D. So you should know what this stands for, I, I, D. Independent and identically random variable with mean with mean mu they are all identically distributed they have the same mean with mean mu um, then if x n bar is the average probability of x n bar deviating from <coughs> multiply epsilon amount is bounded by is equal squared over n epsilon squared, where sigma squared is the variance. Well, it's equal to the variance of xn because they're all identical with the variance of the state. Then it wouldn't matter. Okay? And so let me just give the one line proof of this problem. This is very close to the Turan calculation of yesterday. The Turan calculation was a calculation of omega of m minus log log m squared summation and getting an estimate. And then how, many, how often is it the case that that distance is bigger than some epsilon log log n? And we got an estimate. And therefore, we could say for almost all natural numbers, this function is behaving like log log n. This is why Mark Katz would jump up when he saw the Hardy-Ramanujan paper 
and then re I don't think he ever read the Harding Ramanujan paper because it was in number theory. And somehow or other, he stumbled on a two-page note by Turan, and he said, this is looking like probability theory. And so he would jump at it because it looks exactly like this calculus. This is essentially che what's called Chebyshev's inequality. Um, so the proof is essentially one line. Well, we know by um, Chebyshev bar is this average. Epsilon squared. How do we know this? Well, what is this? This is the integral over the whole measure space of xn bar minus mu squared dp. So that's the definition of variance. definition of variance. And now, how often is this silly thing bigger than epsilon? Well, every time it's bigger than epsilon, it's, the integrand is epsilon squared at least, and the measure of that is what this, is this, sorry, this is probability. Probability, okay? The measure of that thing is, is given by, the measure of that set on which xn minus, xn bar minus mu is bigger than epsilon is given by this divided by Now it's a question of just simply calculating what variance of xn minus mu is. Well, this little exercise here tells you that if you have independent identities distributed random variables, it's an additive function. So you add, you, you add them up, you will see when you do this calculation that this is the xn squared. So what does this mean? And the theorem follows. variance of 1 over n, summation xi, i goes from 1 to n, is nothing but n over n squared times the summation variance of xi, i goes from 1 to n. This variance of xi is the same for sigma squared for every one of them. Summation of sigma squared, 1 over n squared times sigma squared times m. Therefore, you end up so this is sigma squared over n, and this is what I wrote, divided by sigma squared. Okay, so, so what does this show? This shows that the limit n goes to infinity probability that xn minus mu is bigger than epsilon goes to zero. And then there's these things. So that means most of the time, this is xn bar, most of the average, so if you have, you're running an experiment, and you're running, and they're all independent and identically distributed, and you couldn't care less what the distribution is. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's why you do these, how the virus is spreading in this region versus the virus is spreading that to, and a thousand other regions, and you kind of take the average and run this through, you get an idea of what the, of what the convergence rate, where something is moving. So basically, the present, you don't need to know what the distribution function is. As long as the experiment is such that the random variables all have the same distribution function. That's the amazing thing. Okay, so this is what's called the weak law of large numbers. Uh, there's a strong law of large numbers, which is quantum and um, implies the weak law. And if you think about it, if you're a probabilist, you will know that this was using only the second moment. And hence, we understand why Mark Katz is saying, can you do the higher moment? Because a strong law uses the fourth moment. And the central limit theorem uses all the moments. So this is where this is this is the way to understand all of these probability theories. Because it's often taught in a kind of a 
spasmodic fashion with, 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 without this group paying attention to the other group. You have these different discordant terminologies, sometimes reinventing the wheel, and sometimes doing certain things rather awkwardly. Uh, and uh, one has to understand both, and then one has to understand, unify it by some sort of um, neat, comprehensive treatment. So tomorrow's lecture will be um, focusing on um, further applications of probabilistic ideas in, in number theory. One neat application that I will give is um, how do you find the formula for the nth prime number in probability theory? Let's do that tomorrow. Okay. Is this coming through? Is this